Welcome back everybody. I am Matt Williamson and you are watching Pop Goes the 60s. Today I want to do a quick video on an article uh, that was brought to my attention by Rick Beato. I'm sure many of you are, are subscribers to his station or to his channel rather. I love his segments on what makes a song great, but I don't listen to a lot of new music and I just don't care for it especially pop music, the stuff that's in the charts. And I rely on his videos oftentimes to tell me some of the new trends that are going on, what Spotify, what the download rates are, just so I have a little bit of a feel for some of these popular artists now and what kind of rankings they're getting and what kind of sales they have. And I've watched him over many years and watched his channel explode. He did a, a recent video talking about a similar subject, uh, not so much what new music is doing and the hits they're having, but the sales of the old music that we listen to a lot, uh, 20th century music, for lack of a better term, how that music is starting to outsell some of the new music. And he was referencing an article by Ted Goya of The Atlantic. Excellent article. And uh, it kind of, uh, I, I was happy by this because I thought, well, is our, the music that we've listened to, this 20th century music, this classic rock, is this music going to die? Is this going to live on? So here's, a, here's some statistics that uh, show the old music is starting to make a bit of a comeback here. So Goya, this is in a January 23rd, 2022 article. I'll leave a link below. And I'm gonna paraphrase a couple things here, but let me read a couple quotes here from the article. Old songs now represent 70% of the US music market, according to the latest numbers from MRC Data, a music analytics firm. The 200 most popular new tracks now regularly account for less than 5% of total streams. That rate was twice as high just three years ago. So I had no idea. I mean, I'm in my own little 60s bubble here <laughs> and uh, quite content to be so as well. And I don't talk to a lot of younger people that listen to new music. Uh, the younger people that I talk to, they, I, they don't listen to a lot of music or some of the younger people I talk to actually listen to like 60s and 70s stuff. So I don't get good information from my peers or you know just younger people in general. So this was a little bit of a surprise to me that we have a little resurgence of older music via sales. Now he goes on to say, never before in history have new tracks attained hit status while generating so little cultural impact. Success was always short-lived in the music business, but now even new songs that become bona fide hits can pass unnoticed by much of the population. Now, this is something I've been trying to put my finger on for a long time, is what is the difference between this old music and new music? And when I talk to people, you know, friends of mine and music fans, there is just a humanity about the older music that you don't hear in the computer-generated music of today. And what I'm, refer what I'm referring to with today's music that's computer generated, it's a lot of the hits, the pop music that uh, is being pushed today. Uh, a lot of it, you've got the auto tuning and the synthesized sound and the click track, the perfect, perfect beats. And it just, you know, this music, this laptop music that they've taken all the humanity and the soul out of the music. Now, I think one of the things that I've noticed, and a lot of my generation, the generation that's older than me, have, I can clearly notice, is when we listen to today's music and this computer-generated music, we can, we can hear immediately what's missing, and that is the humanity. You can't really sneak that by us, because we're just so used to hearing it one way, and it was of a way, it was created very much organically and artistically, and not by algorithms. So let me carry going on here uh, as Goya continues in this article. One of the things that he, he also brings up uh, the, to show less interest in today's music was the 2021 Grammys. He says in 2021, viewership for the ceremony collapsed 53% from the previous year, from 18.7 million to 8.8 .8 million. It was the least watched Grammy broadcast of all time. Now, the last Grammys uh, just recently were, were canceled. And he said he didn't encounter a single expression of annoyance or regret that the biggest annual event in new music had been put on hold. That's ominous. And I think part of that reason is that the Grammys and these award shows, have just it, they're not about the music as much as they used to be. I mean, they're about politics. There's this inclusionary attempt to 
cover all their bases with all these different categories, which waters down what I feel is the best music. And I think people are just tired of that, you know. So what do they do? They go back to the old music. Another point he makes here has to do with investment. Uh, the leading area of investment in the music business is old songs. And I, I started to notice these artists selling off their catalogs in the last year or so. And one of the things I was aware of is that I know that today's uh, streaming services and the platform by which people listen to music today, which is completely different than the physical style of music we used to buy, it seems like each new platform, the artist makes less and less money. This happened in the shift from the analog world of albums and cassettes to the digital world of CDs. I think new contracts were written based on digital technology. And by the way, the cost of DVD, sorry, CDs, the cost of a CD was twice as much as a record album and probably cost a quarter to make. So all that additional revenue did not go to the artist. So then you go forward some years and we have the internet with your, your iTunes and Amazon and the downloading. And now we have the streaming platforms. I remember David Crosby of Crosby, Stills & Nash recently saying that with the download money he gets at the end of a year, he could take you out to dinner. I mean, that's how little money is generated by streaming and by downloading. One of the things Rick Beato has mentioned is that uh, a song and the money it generates of a play on YouTube, if it has a million plays, that only generates $2,500. That's a lot of plays for not a lot of returns. So we see this shift in artists making less money with these new platforms. And that's why I believe they were selling their catalogs to get the money now, because their monetary legacy, if left to their children or their heirs, was just gonna dwindle, I thought. So I, they're probably figuring, let's take the money now. So some of the catalogs in demand by musicians, uh, the demand is in the 60s artists, the 70s artists, the 80s artists. And let me just read a few of them to you. So some of the catalogs that have just been sold have been Dylan, Springsteen, Dolly Parton, Stevie Nicks, Whitney Houston, Barry Manilow, Tina Turner, David Bowie, ZZ Top, America, Bad Company, Paul Simon, Ray Charles, David Crosby, Taylor Swift, Beach Boys, John Legend, Motley Crue, James Brown, and uh, good old Neil Young, who is no longer rocking the free world like he once did. All of those artists have sold you know, their catalogs in the you know, millions of dollars, and I think part of that is because it obviously has some value today, and the, the biggest value is probably when us old people are still around to appreciate it. So I think that's one of the reasons for it all being unloaded now. This uh, article goes into some other details about some of the other trends. For instance, the best-selling physical format in music right now is the vinyl LP. And that is a format that's more than 70 years old. I'm still I'm astounded and delighted that the record and the vinyl record has made a comeback. And I think um, some people talk about the sound quality of vinyl. I, I don't really buy it for that. I, I've been My investment since I was a kid was in vinyl. I always stuck with it. And when CDs came out, it was much cheaper to buy a mint copy of a used album. I was paying $4.98 for it than buying a new CD, which was $15.98. So it was an easy decision for me. That's why my CD collection is rather meager compared to my album uh, collection. I never try to replace everything, right? Replace some things. But record stores, I mean, it, the record stores that are left, they're not selling as much new music. They're selling old music. They're selling used vinyl. And when I go to the record store, I mean, some of these stores, the used vinyl section sections are larger than the new vinyl section. One of the other things that's making it harder for the new music, uh, Goya states here in the article, he says that when a new song overcomes the, all these obstacles and actually becomes a hit, the risk of copyright lawsuits is higher. And he cites the Blurred Lines jury decision of 2015. That hadn't occurred to me. Um, the other thing is we have dead musicians are now coming back to life in virtual form via, via holograms and deep fake music. And as we see these tribute bands also start to mount, even some of the bands like Journey without the front man, Steve Perry, people are still flocking to see Journey in great numbers. So there's a trend in live music to still see the old timers. So in the article here, Goya, his, his baby boomer friends tell him that um, 
like what I said earlier, the, they, the baby boomers think the decline in popularity of new music is simply the result of lousy new songs. And that goes back to what I said earlier about the new music, this laptop computer music that we're hearing, takes the humanity out of it, takes the soul out of it. And all those flaws in the human being is help what makes that artistic. And um, there's this, this trend to just repeat the hit. And that's what they're doing nowadays. And in the old days, there was always a little bit. Of it. You want to, you have a formula, you try to follow it. But generally speaking, in the rock music world, since the Beatles, it was the artists that drove the change. They drove the art. They were always pushing past the the mundane and the formula. That's where things started to change and get better, get more interesting. And that was really competitive to get to the next area first. So you weren't relying so much on trends and on who, what the last hit was. You're worried about the next hit. He goes into some information here about, he talks about the algorithms, that music algorithms are designed to be feedback loops, loops ensuring that the promoted new songs are virtually identical to your favorite old songs. That's actually how the current system is designed to work. And I think that's probably why it's not working so well. We get far more variety by listening to the old stuff. Now he goes on to say, um, Goya mentions that this isn't a problem uh, of a lack of good music, a good new music, but he states that we have a music institution now and with a failure to discover and nurture that new music. So there's no nurturing going on if they're going to just try to rewrite it, resample it, adjust the beats so they're perfect, so you don't have any of that artist's quality in there. I mean. The Rolling Stones, I mean, I can't imagine them on a click track, really. I mean, that stuff would just wouldn't sound the same. And I think that what we're seeing here is these artists are, like, I guess what I'm saying is they'll take a part of the artist, a part of their talent, and just computerize it and duplicate it and manipulate it and to fit the suit, which is completely on rock and roll. So Goya does a very nice job of reminding us that when Elvis took over the culture coming from the poorest state in America, lowly Mississippi, uh, they were more shocked than anybody, they being the record companies. It happened again the following decade with the arrival of the British invasion from lowly Liverpool, again a working class place, unnoticed by the entertainment system. So it happened again with the hip hop generation. So what he's saying here at the end, he sums it up very nicely by saying these musical revolutions come from the bottom up, not from the top down, and that the CEOs are the last to know. So I think that is just a great way to sum up where the music industry is now. And um, I I'm going to take it one step further here. Um, I've been thinking about this quite a lot because it appears to me that with the advent of the computer and music software and we had the Napster era and the, the, the scared record companies trying to keep people from exchanging music freely. Uh, we had the uh, Communications Act of 1996 which merged several of the record companies so it was more of a, it's become more of a monopoly which is why we get less variety. What this suggests to me is that I look at this as two separate centuries. I'm looking at the 21st century as the computer music generation, and we look at the 20th century as this artistically analog time period. And I think what's going to happen is we're going to view the 20th century as an artistic movement of music. I think you could say the same for film. But I, th I think like much like we watch uh, we look at old art in museums. We had this, I, I did a video recently on this wonderful Van Gogh exhibit that immersed you in his paintings via projection. It was a wonderful new way to experience it. And people are inventing new ways to experience beautiful art. We still watch films like Casablanca, and we still like to hear old jazz and we still like to see sculptures and go to museums, but we're looking at things that are from different time periods that are from different art movements. And I suggest that the music movements, there are several music movements in the 20th century, not unlike Art Nouveau or Cubism or Surrealism, 
You have jazz, you have blues, you have rock, you have country. I think those will all be considered movements from the 20th century that I, I'm not quite sure we'll be able to replicate those ever again in future years. I don't know that there's even a need to. But I guess my point is, is that I think we, we are in a territory now where, uh, I mean, I'm not denying, I, I don't want to put down new music because there's some wonderful musicians out there. The musicians, the new music that I find new, I do find it. It's just not the popular stuff. It's not stuff that's going to sell a lot. And it gets to me somehow. I, I do search it out here and there, and some people do recommend things to me. So I do get little, little bits and pieces here and there. But it seems to me that the die has been cast. And so long as technology is allowed to run rampant via uh, monopolies, you're not going to get variety. You're going to get anything but artistic. I mean, I guess there's art, artistic... There's art within the design of software and all that. I get that. But where the music is concerned, the more human humanity you take out of it, I think the less popular it's going to be. So that's just a quick, quick little reaction to uh, this Ted Goya article and Rick Beato's video. Thanks to both of them. What do you guys think? I mean, I have a, I have a bit of an older audience. Um, what do you think about new music? Where is it going? Where is it not going? And will this old music last? Let me know your thoughts below. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.